thank you very much, Bill. Uh, thanks, Caitlin, as well for the uh, for, for the logistics and, and and get everything sorted. And apologies to everybody for the the relatively early morning and, and messing up your usual schedule. Um, it's a it's a real privilege to, uh, to to come and speak to a distinguished audience. Um, I, I I was lucky enough to spend three months over in Monterey and Carmel. In 2015, um, as I said to Bill just before this started, I could have quite happily stayed if I'd have lost my passport. I wouldn't have been too upset. Um, I had a brilliant time, met some brilliant people, and I know it's a couple of people on the call that I remember. So thank you for for joining, and nice to see you, albeit virtually rather than in person. Um, of course, it would be brilliant um, to have come back in person, but uh, the the last 15 months or so have, have meant that can't be. But hopefully, I'll get a chance at some point in the future it's a place very close to my heart and time spent there was very enjoyable and so I made some great friends and and, and, and had a brilliant time so so thank you for that um what I want to do as, as Bill said this this is a, a a variant for want of a better word of a talk that I gave a few months back and it's a it's a talk to try and give a bit of an introduction to some research that that I'm currently working on building a team to look at and um, which I was very lucky to get some money from the European Union just before, fortunately, we finally left. I think I just got in there before they decided to uh, not, not, not to do anything nice to anybody in the UK. Um, and that's to work on this, this, this broader project, which I've titled um, Towards a Third Nuclear Age and sometimes the, the Nuclear Revolution. And the basic idea here, and it's the culmination probably of 10 years worth of work, including work I did um, back in Monterey six years ago, of trying to understand the intersection of technology, particularly so-called new or disruptive technology, and nuclear order. And this began with uh, looking at missile defence. It's um, uh, gone into some other sort of iterations as well, the precision strike and other stuff, the cyber book, of which the work I did um, back in, in 2015. Uh, and I'm trying to put this all together. So, so I was lucky enough to get quite a decent bit of money for this, which has given me the time, uh, the ability to hire a, a team of excellent people to really investigate and think about whether we're moving into a new nuclear age, whether we should label this a third nuclear age, and I fully hope and expect there might be some pushback of that labelling. And if so, what do we do? How do we think about this? How do we keep ourselves safe going forward? And what I uh, intend to say is speak for probably about 35 minutes or so and give plenty of time for questions. And as you'll see, there's there's some research findings here, findings here, there's some questions, there's some strands which I'm beginning to unpack. So, so I'm hoping that this will, uh, of course, be of interest, but also a, a discussion and conversation that, that we can both benefit from going forward uh, too. Uh, I've just put my Twitter address and email account on there. I, I think Caitlin is going to make the presentation available um, to people. So if you do want to get in touch, um, pl please feel free to do so. Let me see if I can get to that. There we go. So. <laughs> As I mentioned, this this project um, is actually the culmination probably of the best part of 10 years worth of thinking and research and goes back to some work I did with Ben Zala over at the, who, well, formerly at the University of Leicester, now at the Australian National University. Um, and this was looking into this idea of what we called at the time advanced conventional weapons. So we'd recognise that there was a significant technological change going on, particularly in the United States and um, going back probably before the end of the Cold War, but really became apparent during the Bush administration and was and was sort of moved forward as well by the Obama administration too. And we published an article back in 2013 in the Non-Proliferation Review looking at this, and it was something basically linking the Obama administration's approach to these non-nuclear strategic capabilities uh, and how this didn't really fit with their broader ideas of arms control and non-proliferation. And, and what we've done and what I've done over the last um, seven or eight years since then is, is begin to unpack, expand and think about this. So this project began with a, a, a belief that there were significant technologies, weapons, systems and perhaps a broader context that were important, were having an impact, but not a specific um, list of exactly what, what were then called advanced conventional weapons had to include. Um, it was a bit of a recognition that it would have to involve non-nuclear precision strike across all domains, so underwater, on land and increasingly in space, all of which were being facilitated by enhanced sensing, tracking, data processing um, and a whole host of other technologies as well. There was clearly also a move, and this linked with the, with the PhD work, towards much more capable methods of defence, whether that be in kinetic interception, and I know the jury is to some extent still out, um, on that, but there's clearly been a move towards normal normalization, spread, acceptance, and deployment um, of a number of different systems. But also an idea that defense 
um, in this particular space could be done with other capabilities as well, not least so-called left of launch, which links with this broader idea of, of cyber or computer network operations. And that cyber thread, something which I've looked at a little bit in the past, which, which Bill mentioned, um, was important in a number of ways too, not just in terms of the number of of different types of operations and different types of vulnerabilities, not least because all nuclear armed states are, are modernizing and in some cases digitizing systems, but also because of this broader context, digitize information, revolution, give it whatever label you will, context that we seem to be moving in that would have an impact across um, systems, actors, relationships, uh, and order more broadly. It's also been a recognition um, of an increased, and I mentioned increased because AI and automation really aren't that new when it comes to nuclear weapons, but the way that they may be used or deployed or incorporated is, but a recognition that this is speeding up and that the possibilities and the way that it may be used um, is changing, possibly um, for the worst. A broader theme, again, which is linked in with this idea of moving into a digital or information um, age, of that we're living in a real-time nuclear information space. You know, we only need to think a little bit about the former US president and the use of Twitter, but the broader impact of social media and the information realm and space on, again, how decisions would be made that just seems completely different um, from even a generation, if not two generations um, ago. There's a recognition, of course, that this might be fluid and change. Some of the things we're seeing now may be temporary, may be dealt with. Um, and part of this, I think, and I'll come on to this, um, is because a lot of this has to be seen in a political context. It's not just technologies, it's the politics, it's the political decisions and thinking and strategy that underpins it as well. Um, so I think, again, this was beginning to try and unpack that problem. But the, the key thing that, again, going right back to 2013, but, but, but even more so since then, that, that Ben and I wanted to push forward, was that it wasn't just one technology in particular, as may have been the case in the past, but when we take all of these together, we do have a real sort of a mixture of different dynamics that could present, if not different questions, then perhaps even a need to rethink what we think we know about nuclear order. So it didn't necessarily mean that we have to throw everything out, that everything that was developed primarily or principally in the 1960s was wrong, um, or that you know it does, doesn't make sense in today's world, but it clearly meant that we needed to go back and rethink and relook and reassess whether what we understand about deterrence, stability, arms control, proliferation and, and all the rest um, was actually fit for purpose in a context um, which seemed to be quite different from, from most of that which had gone before. So again, that's kind of the rationale um, of the project and some of the stuff that we've begun to think about. So that those of you that, that, that follow this sort of stuff quite closely, and I'm sure many of you do, given uh, given where you are currently based, um, it's worth just reiterating and, and perhaps hammering home why we should be interested or, or worried about this. Um, I've touched on this, but what's happening today with the systems, uh, the types of technological change and possibly new dynamics and dangers that, that, that come from this seems to be different from the past. Um, many of these systems are non-nuclear, many are non-kinetic, non-tangible, dual use and dual capable. Um, they all seem to be reaching fruition or being deployed or being developed at roughly the same time. And I think perhaps most importantly, it's weapon systems and capabilities, as well as a context that is changing. And I think this makes it really quite different from periods in the past. Disruptive technology in, or the impact of disruptive technologies in nuclear order is not new. You can point to many different examples in the past, but it does seem that there's much more going on this time and much more that we need to be thinking about. Also, and unlike in the past, the impact seems to be global and our analysis and understanding and investigation needs to be global. There are more players than before. This is not that it really ever was, but this is not a purely Euro-Atlantic or US-Russia problem. This is something that is happening in all parts of the world and quite often in parts of the world um, that include non-nuclear armed states too. Um, many of the, the major powers are engaged in the development of these technologies. Many, I think, have not necessarily thought it fully through or not, not thought through all the implications of where this is going. And this is impacting in different regions already in different ways. So I think this need to look beyond the typical focus of US, Russia or, or Euro-Atlantic centrism. There's clearly, when we take these things together and, and particularly when we think of the difference and the global nature of the challenge, potential um, to significantly cha change or challenge these sort of central tenets of nuclear orthodoxy or order. There seems to me the least perception that 
a state could achieve a non-nuclear first strike capability. Again, something different from the past where it may well have been purely nuclear. Complications for mutual vulnerability, which we may already be seeing, and implications for the nuclear taboo and norm of non-use. We may well see that crises escalate in different unpredictable and unintended ways. It's not entirely clear to me that we had a full grasp on how crises would escalate in the past. And of course, luckily, we didn't have to test that many times. But it may well be that how we thought about crises in the past doesn't necessarily apply today because of the interaction uh, and potential different pathways because of these different technologies. Could well be changes in the nature of proliferation. We may actually become more concerned about the proliferation of non-nuclear technologies in this space. Uh, and this, as I'll come on to slightly later, could have implications for how we think about disarmament. Disarmament through technological reasons rather than political, ethical, moral, um, or even financial. What we are clearly also seeing, and as alluded to in the first slide, is a com compression of decision-making time for policymakers, increased complexity in the system and world that has to be engaged with, and the blurring of the nuclear information space, all of which make me really quite worried. This compression of time, the inability to necessarily get reliable information, um, too much information perhaps, um, are all real challenges that we're going to have to manage going forward. And then all of this kind of seems to suggest that um, there is likely to be an undermining of arms control and the frameworks um, of global nuclear governance. And we're already, I think, seeing this to some extent and beginning to see that we may need to expand, rejuvenate or, or, or even replace some of these uh, mechanisms going forward. And this kind of all leads. And, and again, this is something that's built up over, over a few years, lots of conversation with different people looking at this in different ways, but creates the question of whether we have the political and conceptual frameworks in academia, in the professional world and, and in government to fully understand and address this. Again, there is a concern about an overly or overly Western way of thinking about this stuff, a belief that whatever worked in the past will continue to work in the future um, without necessarily really interrogating whether that's the case. And of course, ultimately, we do base a lot of our assumptions about our nuclear world and risk reduction and um, and nuclear dangers more broadly on a fairly small amount of data. Um, and that, of course, has it in, includes its limitations as well. Now, there is literature on, on some of this stuff, particularly um, broader technological challenges, some excellent um, material on particular systems, whether it be AI or hypersonics or, or whatever else you want to look at. There is also some great stuff um, looking at uh, the complications in particular regional contexts or possible, uh, as James Acton puts it, entanglement between certain systems in certain contexts. But what I felt and what this project tries to do is step back and say, well, actually, there's quite a lot going on here. It seems that there is a broader shift or a broader transition in what's going on. It is more than the sum of its parts. So the way I tried to frame this or think about framing this, and, and as we'll come on to, I, I realise this is not unproblematic, um, is to think about this in terms of if it's a new nuclear, if there's some things really have changed, then are we on the cusp of a, a third nuclear age of a distinctly different period in our nuclear history where the rules of the game, the major threats, the major responses will change? Now, again, I'm sure you're familiar with this, that there is a fairly um accepted i suppose to some extent idea that we can split our nuclear history into a first nuclear age which is broadly synonymous with the cold war and focuses almost entirely on the, the us russia central balance the risk of major nuclear exchange arms racing etc cetera, etc cetera. um and that of course during this period we see the growth of arms control of the non-proliferation treaty and, and the establishment of mutual vulnerability as a, a major sort of ordering principle of, of international relations the theory goes that at some point, probably between 1989 and 1990, we, uh, we, we finish this with the end of the Cold War and we enter into a, a new nuclear age, a second nuclear age, uh, which has become popularised. The idea being that the major threats or locus of international nuclear policy shifts. It's not that that central balance goes away, but rather our focus turns to regional proliferation, rogue actors. Um, of which Iraq and the Iraq war are an obvious example, or of course terrorists, with 9-11 being, um, uh, being in a, uh, sorry, the terrorist attacks of 9-11 being an event that really solidified this idea, I think, in many people's minds, not least the Bush administration. And during that second nuclear age, we see a shift in the so-called remedies or, or mechanisms of control. Uh, arms control, the, the, the stuff of the first nuclear age doesn't go away, but it is complemented by moves towards nuclear security, counter-proliferation, an extension of the MPT, um, and various other things 
as well. But the key, the key thing here is there's a there's a shift in focus of where we see the main risks. And I think it is important to say that this is something, again, that is a very Western idea of how we split nuclear history, but I'll, I'll come back to that. So the argument is, and I put 2020 in there just for means of convenience more than anything else, but the idea here is that what we're either on the cusp of or we've just begun is a new nuclear age where actually our focus, our attention, policymakers, um, attention and focus too, needs to shift to something slightly different. And this is the vulnerabilities and uncertainties created by new technologies that may lead to deliberate or inadvertent nuclear use, going back to these things I mentioned in those first two slides. And as I've noted before, there is at least a question or at least a chance that this means we need to rethink how we manage nuclear risks. If we accept that the central risks of nuclear orders have changed, whether or not you agree with the idea of a third nuclear age or not, we, we have to go back and look at how we manage this, how we can ensure nuclear peace and maybe invent or recreate or rediscover mechanisms in order to achieve this. And one of the things that I, I've been quite fascinated by is that actually and this might be completely serendipitous, but I think there's more to it, is that it, this third nuclear age is also going to be a nuclear age um, uh, wherein we, we will probably, where, where we have the nuclear ban treaty. So we have a very different mechanism, albeit not a mechanism necessarily to control the risks that I've mentioned, or at least not directly, but already a move towards different types of international governance structures um, to address what may well be a new nuclear era. So I think there's already a move and a recognition um, that things may have to change. So as I mentioned before, the, the idea of, of nuclear ages um, is by no means unproblematic. Um, they are not um, historically particularly accurate, of course, um, it doesn't, you know, most of you will be fully aware that there were not only two nuclear powers between 1945 and, and 1990. The world became multipolar in the 1950s when the UK uh, developed nuclear weapons. And in fact, most of the so-called proliferation challenges that we think about in the second nuclear age, India, Pakistan, uh, probably the, the most notable, were really well on the way to becoming established nuclear powers in that first nuclear age. So there's kind of a bit of a bit of a problem in terms of the history uh, in terms of how this works. But what it does do is it gives us a lens to think about what were the major concerns animating and focusing policymakers and, and, and academics and professionals at any one time. It's also, I think, important to note, and there's no easy way to do this, but nuclear ages kind of bleed into one another. They don't stop on a particular day and start the next, notwithstanding the uh, conceptual convenience of, of the end of the Cold War for something like this. So it's about the locus of attention at any particular point in our nuclear story, as much as that specific historical accuracy. And I think one of the, uh, the there's, a, there's a great literature on this, including Paul Bracken's book and many others that talk about the second nuclear age and how it's a shift in terms of where we look. But I think the best book in terms of conceptualizing ages or nuclear ages is Colin Gray's second nuclear age book, where he actually talks about uh, what it means to shift between nuclear ages and how we might know um, if that happens. So I, I, I don't necessarily agree with everything that Colin Gray says in this work. Uh, in, in the quote that I've got here about three quarters of the way down the page, he says that these concepts are massively supportable empirically. I, I'm not sure that's always true, but they are definitely useful. And they are useful because I think they provide a mechanism for highlighting, whether it be in government circles or, or other uh, fora, of framing, prioritizing, and drawing attention to particular nuclear risk. And again, I think um, that is the real use and the value of using a construct such as a nuclear age. It's also, I think it's probably entirely fair to say, a bit of a gimmick to try and sell this to get attention. But I think that's quite an important part as well, getting attention at all levels of society to a nuclear world that may not quite be as stable or as understandable um, as, as, as we sometimes like to think. So in a sense, um, and I don't want to undermine my argument too much, but it doesn't really matter whether you agree with the notion of nuclear ages or a third nuclear age, but it's about drawing attention to it. It's about engaging with the debate on it. So if you, you know, if, if, the, if the purpose or at the end of this talk, we end up discussing whether it's a new nuclear age or not, and whether the technologies mean things are different, it's done its job. It's drawn our attention to it. It's made us talk about it. It's made us think through some of the dynamics that that label is, is trying to encapsulate. So one of the first things uh, that we did with the project to try and map this out um, was to think uh, was, was, was this publication that Ben and I had published earlier this year with the European Journal of International Security. Uh, and this was basically trying to put into an article format an argument about saying, look, 
there are these capabilities. There are a number of really important things going on in the world. We believe there is enough going on here to make a case for a shift in nuclear studies, in, in nuclear order, um, towards this so-called third nuclear age. Um, we made a number of different arguments here. So firstly, the, again, from the previous slide, that thinking in terms of nuclear ages is useful. Um, it is important, and it has particularly been influential in, for example, US policy circles in how nuclear threats are thought about. Secondly, and importantly, that it is the interaction between these technological dynamics and particularly perceptions of how it might play out, not least because many of the capabilities we talk about um, are intangible, uh, much less easy to quantify than in the past. And this is absolutely key. So again, it's not focusing on one particular thing, but trying to look more broadly and trying to look at things in the round. And then thirdly, and I'll come on to this in the next slide, that we can begin to think about how this might play out if we do a thought experiment that logically the different pathways, the different types of scenarios that could unfold in the third nuclear age, um, given this impact um, of what we previously called advanced conventional weapons, but what um, have now become what, what we chose to, 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 to rebrand re as strategic non-nuclear weapons. Um, the reason for that shift, and there are some other, other examples, people, you know, James Acton has used um, strategic conventional weapons is another one, but we felt the use of the word conventional seems to suggest you can't have unconventional capabilities. And I think that's an important part of this. And by just putting advanced conventional, um, it could apply to a lot broader, a, a much broader range of technologies where what we're really interested in is things that impact at the strategic and specifically nuclear level. So again, happy to um, be interested in what, what people think about that labeling. Um, but again, might be a subtle change, but I think quite an important one in terms of um, how we're trying to frame the debate. So the four possible scenarios that, that we came up with, and, and again, you, you may well be able to think of other ones. Um, this wasn't meant to be comprehensive, but it was a, a thought experiment to show you know, the different worlds that we may inhabit in the short, medium, and possibly long term. Um, the first and probably the most likely and kind of where we are now was this idea of strategic non-nuclear weapons uh, sorry, strategic non-nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons proliferate most states. So this is basically a return to arms racing, concerns about um, new threats to stability or undermining of deterrence drive most major nuclear armed states um, to proliferate. Um, so you again, I think this is where we are now. It's obviously an end to, to any sort of arms control. Disarmament goes out the window, but it may be that you, you achieve some sort of stability um, through this in, in, in the longer term, or at least periods of relative stability um, through this. A second possibility um, is that you have a, a state achieves a temporary strategic advantage um, in strategic non-nuclear weapons. And this we thought would potentially be the most destabilizing. Um, it seems from our current vantage point, this would probably be the United States, but it's by no means guaranteed that another one of the major nuclear arms states um, couldn't achieve this in the future. And the idea here would be that a state would either achieve or perhaps importantly believe they'd achieved or the adversary believed that state had achieved um, a possible advantage, a strategic advantage that maybe meant um, so it may, may, may be provided for extra leverage and coercion and possibly even um, a non-nuclear first strike capability. And of course, this would be the most destabilizing. It's possible that scenario two could emerge after um, a, a certain amount of time with with um, scenario one and, and vice versa. So these may be fleeting um, periods that just arise um, th throughout the, the, you know, the, the, as we move forward. The third scenario and what Ben and I thought was probably the most appealing um, from the current vantage point was that we have restraint in strategic non-nuclear weapon deployment. So all of those technologies that I mentioned at the start um, are fitted into existing arms control or new methods of restraint and norms are developed to ensure that they don't reach full fruition, don't create the problems that we believe um, they might. The flip side of this, of course, is it is a tacit acceptance that nuclear weapons will remain the central currency of the major powers. Um, and again, it doesn't necessarily bode well for disarmament. It, there's, it, again, the, the, these are not kind of either or. You could have a period of restraint followed by a breakout capability with, with, with advantage. Um, and, and so, so these, these could be in flux. The most transformative and, and potentially revolutionary scenario um, and we're not necessarily saying this is by any means very likely, but is that in the long run, we achieve a situation whereby strategic non-nuclear weapons become the go-to currency of international politics and effectively cancel each other out. So you have a world of non-nuclear 
SS, SNNW deterrence rather than nuclear deterrence. And it is at least conceivable, theoretically, that this is the way to a world without nuclear weapons, that states increasingly rely on this capability um, instead of nuclear weapons. Now, there are, of course, a, no, a whole host of quite big questions about how you would ever get to this place, how you would ensure against cheating and breakout and, and all of the things that come with um, the broader nuclear disarmament debate. But I think it is an interesting way of framing this problem because it is at least theoretically and logically um, some of what you could get to in the long run. Disarmament through technology rather than those things, moral, political, um, normative, etc., cetera, um, that I mentioned before. Again, there may be other scenarios. These may be interchangeable. We thought this was a good way of beginning to think about and framing what the impact of these technologies might mean going forward. A second and more recent strand um, of this project has been to try and, I put here demystify, but try and unpack and examine what's really meant by the emerging and disruptive technology challenge um, and what this means for nuclear risk. Now, it, over the last sort of two years or so, or perhaps a bit more, um, it's hard to attend any, or it's, it's unusual to attend any conference or workshop or, or even indeed read much commentary on the issue of nuclear weapons without somebody saying we should be worried about emerging and disruptive tech or new emerging and disruptive tech. But quite often there was very little um, engagement um, other than sort of throwing around various labels um, of what these things really meant, who was doing what, how they actually impacted, what was new, what we should worry about, and of course, importantly, um, what we should try and do going forward. So what I did in this paper for the EU Non-Proliferation and Disarmament Consortium, which was published a few months ago as well, is, is try and do exactly this. Take what I thought were the five or six main technologies and put them in context. Um, have a look, well, how new are things like hypersonic weapons? Um, how worried should we be about AI and automation? Where could it be? Where could it be applied or employed? Where might it? What are the reasons why it might be limited? And what this suggested was that some aspects of these technologies are less worrying and more marginal than um, conventional wisdom, or at least a lot of the kind of hyped media seem to suggest. The implications were often far more specific and sometimes futuristic um, than was suggested. Uh, and that there was often this tendency, I think, for a conflation and worst case scenario thinking. So again, it was trying to drive down and say, well, okay, this probably is quite a worrying set of things. And I think they are from what, from what you've said, uh, sorry, from what, from what I've said to you at the start of this talk, but that actually might be a little bit more nuanced um, than is sometimes the case. And I think sometimes again, and, and this is, is often a problem in, in the broader literature in, in terms of cyber, I certainly noticed it, but it, in our literature as well, was a kind of a, a laziness in terms of how various labels were being used and a difference in what they meant by different people. I mean, new, emerging and disruptive technology all mean very different things. If you use new, you, you, you don't have half of the technologies I've mentioned here, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then the final thing that I wanted to get through with this paper, and bear in mind this was written as a kind of a primer for EU policymakers and, and professionals, um, was that we should be very careful just to think or, or technologically stovepipe. So yes, there are technologies here that could be worrying or could be concerning and could lead to some of those scenarios that I mentioned in the previous slide. But this is a political problem. It is political decisions how they are deploy deployed. It is political decisions how these feed into existing relationships. It is political decisions how they are managed. So a more dangerous techno-military environment is not necessarily a foregone conclusion. And that restraint scenario that I mentioned is a possibility. So I won't, I, I, I won't go through, through all of this. I can comment in, in the Q&A um, if people want more um a bit more detail on them and, and a lot of this is not necessarily new this is kind of synthesizing what a lot of very smart people have already said about various technologies uh, i suppose i'll just pick a couple but hypersonic weapons would be a really good example here now that seems to be the almost like the, the poster child of the disruptive new emerging disruptive tech challenge well when you look into it the hypersonic the idea of hypersonic weapons is not actually that new they're not that different to existing capabilities particularly ballistic missiles and um, speed is not really the great variant. Various other types of missile can be uh, maneuvered as well. And there's a whole host of other things which lead, you, lead, lead me certainly to suggest that hypersonic weapons should be much, viewed much more on a continuum um, and as an extension of existing capabilities than something that is entirely new. Um, Another point in the paper was to try and sort of say, well, what can we do to, to remedy some of this? And it struck me that one of the biggest risks or concerns around hypersonic weaponry was, was how it's deployed and the lack of transparency, something that appears much better in the, in the nuclear realm, 
But there's a real concern here that hypersonic weapons that could deploy both nuclear and non-nuclear warheads may be deployed in ways that are very difficult for an adversary to ascertain, possibly deliberately, but that this had clear escalatory and misperception um, potential. And one of the ideas I floated there, I don't suppose it's very likely, but was to think along the lines of the INF about how you could um, prohibit certain types of hypersonic deployment in Europe, or at least um, make sure you were very clear about where certain types of system uh, were being deployed. And of course, let's not forget, um, there's no reason why, given the hypersonic boost glide um, capabilities quite often will be launched by a, a, a similar launch vehicle to a ballistic missile, that they can't be included in similar things such as New Start and New Start follow on, um, which, which prohibits those types of things. Um, it's probably worth mentioning cyber as well. I mean, as, as Bill said, I, I did do a project previous to this looking at the cyber nuclear intersection. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to look more broadly, because it became very clear that looking at cyber in isolation just kind of didn't capture the whole picture. But I think there's a, there's a number of things that are that are worrying in, in, in this realm. The one that really worries me, and there's not a huge amount of information on it, but that there's bits that sort of come out every now and again, is, is this idea of left of launch. So traditional kinetic... Um, ballistic missile defense deployments, which is, you know, radars, satellite, shoot your interceptor missile to, to intercept and adversaries, um, has been problematic enough in the past. But this idea of left of launch, which is essentially taking the right of launch, as I've just described, um, and moving it forward, trying to stop missiles or stop systems before they can be used or missiles be fired, I think becomes really, really worrying. And um, cyber is only one, or what we sort of term as cyber is only one method of this. Um, or computer network operations is, is probably a better, better phrase. It could also include electronic warfare um, and other things as well. But what it essentially does, in, and I was told this in, in a previous talk, which I gave on this topic, is don't call it left of launch, it's preemption. Um, and I think that pretty much captures uh, where we are with this. So, so the risk of seeking to mess around in other people's nuclear systems so they don't work is a massive worry. Uh, and that is, uh, that is sort of a, 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 an amalgamation of BMD, cyber, um, and precision strike all in all in one go. And, and part of the reason it's so worrying is that unlike with um, right of launch traditional BMD, you can't see this stuff. You don't know what the capability is. You don't know um, where it's deployed. You can't count it. Um, so it becomes very, very difficult. And again, it increases the fear and potential for, to, for, for misperception. And of course, even the possibility that somebody might be doing this, I'll give an example that the United States um, could be messing around in North Korean missile programs. Doesn't even matter if they do or not, the idea is already there and that's already powerful um, in its own right. I, I will also just quickly mention a couple of the other technologies which I haven't looked into, but I think potentially are quite important in this space. So nanotechnology and, and the whole idea of mini nukes, there may be people on this call that know more about this stuff than I do. The possible impact of quantum sensing, including uh, quantum clocks and various other things on how you might be able to find stuff um, particularly underwater or, or in other things, um, but a whole host of other things that come with that as well. And almost a rediscovery of the importance of directed energy weapons. Um, it's never really gone away in the missile defense mission, um, but I think could also have an impact across many of these other technologies as well. And three broad points that I, that, that, that I brought out of that and that I think we can take away um, is that when we put this together, um, there are increasingly credible or at least conceivable ways that you could threaten so-called secure second strike forces. And again, I'm sure everybody on this, this call will know this, but, but the idea that um, if you put missiles on very quiet submarines or if you put them, um, if you make them mobile on land and you can hide them, or whether it's on railways or roads and hide them in whatever, um, they're very, very hard to attack and therefore they are secure. Therefore, it's believed that you can't be targeted in the first strike. Well, if you, um, and again, this is principally the United States at the moment, but could be others going forward. If we move into an era where more states can find stuff reliably, track it, um, and of course be able to target it with whether it be long range kinetic or whether it be some other non kinetic method, then you would potentially create some real problems at the heart of, of nuclear strategy for certain states, not least um, for the United Kingdom, where I am now, uh, which relies on submarines. Uh, just on submarines, for submarines, for its, for its nuclear deterrent. If those submarines become somehow more discoverable or less um, stealthy, uh, the UK has a real problem. Second aspect to this that became clear was a need to 
rediscover and maybe reinvent some sort of arms control. I've already mentioned that hypersonic weapons, particularly glide, uh, particularly boost glide vehicles, could fit into existing ideas of how we do it and traditional mechanisms of arms control. But it may be that we have to think a little bit outside the box in terms of, of other types of mechanisms of control uh, and frameworks for some of these other things. It's not easy to see how, for example, AI and autonomy fit into this. It must, might be much more about how it's, how it's applied and where it's applied and thinking about controlling and managing that and then finally and it's something i've mentioned earlier but, it, but again I, i'll flag it up it seems quite clear that when you put all of this stuff together that there are lots of different possible pathways across different domains um that are that, that could be a real concern and, and i think there's a real i certainly would be worried that there's a lack of understanding about how things could escalate very quickly in ways that couldn't necessarily be um or, or weren't necessarily thought of previously and then the, the, the final part of where we are with the project now and perhaps the most um, problematic to some extent but also perhaps the most exciting is trying to move beyond this technological focus so I, I think I hope what I've said in those previous few slides suggests that there is a technological challenge at the heart of this shift to a new nuclear age of, of different types of nuclear risks that is definitely at the heart of this but it is not the only thing Technology doesn't exist in a vacuum, um, and it's increasingly clear that we have to see the, the politics of this, the geopolitics of this, and perhaps increasingly the normative elements as well. And, and this may run the risk ultimately of watering down the third nuclear age concept, or it may be something that I should park and look at somewhere else. But I think doing a project like this is the perfect opportunity to try and broaden this out. And if you think of concentric circles, the different, um, the different layers of the problem that we need to engage with. So the first part and something that I've begun working on with Ben is, is trying to link this idea of the third nuclear age, strategic non-nuclear weapons, the return of kind of um, nuclear great power politics. Um, the, there's a sort of an idea that, again, fits into the nuclear ages literature that the, the first nuclear age was really all about the US and Russia. The second one really was about US nuclear polarity to some extent, or certainly unipolarity. Um, and that this new nuclear age will be the first genuine multi-power, multipolar nuclear age, where you have India, China, Russia, the US, and potentially others using nuclear weapons, understanding nuclear weapons as an important component of statecraft. Also, we've seen by many of those actors, less so perhaps India, um, a return to nuclear rhetoric. Um, and I think there's some quite important links there between the role of nuclear weapons, the return of, of great power politics, uh, and perhaps a shift or a transition in the axes on which global uh, nuclear politics and, and politics more broadly are based. So I would see that as the second concentric circle that's going on. And of course, decisions taken by the leaders in those powers will have enormous significance um, for how are the, are the impact of these different technologies in the third nuclear age. Another aspect of this is trying to look at the relationship between technology and politics from a different angle. And this is where I've been very lucky with one of the members of my team, Cameron Hunter, who's a uh, who's got a background in science and technology studies and, and has brought a very different angle to this, and particularly the idea of um, not baying to technological determinism, but trying to understand the relationship between technology and politics society, from a society point of view, from a policymaking point of view, um, and also therefore understanding the potential um, to understand how certain decisions are reached, how certain technologies come about, um, but also therefore hopefully how to control them as well. And one book that I would recommend on this, uh, anybody that is interested more broadly, is, is Donald McKenzie's Inventing Accuracy, which basically charts uh, the US uh, nuclear warhead program uh, and how it basically warheads and, and, and missile systems became more and more accurate, not really because of any strategic rationale, but because of various politics and various other things that were going on at the same time. And I think that's something we can we can use here and take from when we begin to think about how we manage and mitigate some of the challenges posed by technology, of, of making sure we consider them in their technological and sociological context. A slightly less developed part of this, but I think increasingly important, is how we understand nuclear risk more broadly and the level of both elite and public level interest with this. Now, it's probably not surprising that at the moment, nuclear risks are not at the top of everybody's agenda. People are focused on COVID, and perhaps quite rightly, and, and pandemic, pandemics more broadly. And before that, um, on climate change and global warming is a major thing. Um, that, that may well be justified, but I think there's a concern here that we're moving into an era where 
um, there is just less fear about nuclear weapons. And that may be a good thing on one level, but on another, if it means less interest, less engagement and less pressure for, for whatever outcome, um, you know, a particular person believes should happen, then I think that's problematic. And, and this is something that I've begun to discuss uh, a little bit in a couple of publications, one for the for the bulletin uh, last year, which I wrote with a medical professor from the University of Birmingham, basically saying this um, and, and paraphrases uh, your, your very own Jeffrey Lewis. I don't know if Jeffrey's on the on this call, but but Jeffrey wrote something a while back saying that COVID is essentially like a nuclear war in, in, in slow motion. And, and I think there's there's an awful lot to that. Some of the things we saw, certainly in the UK, looting, services not working, general panic are exactly what would happen in a nuclear crisis or nuclear risk. But of course, it would be far, far worse, not least the fact um, most people could just about get to still get to see their doctors. Uh, we have now, of course, had, uh, or a lot of people have been able to have um, uh, various medicines, um, and, and of course, the broader drive to get everybody uh, inoculated. Well, this is just not going to be the same in, in a nuclear war. So I think there's a really interesting analogy there. And we can think about to bring people's attention back to these challenges. And then finally, and this is drawing on some work that we're doing with, with Benoit Pelopidis um, over at Sciences Po and his, his nuclear knowledge's work, is to maybe use this idea of a third nuclear age as a vehicle to go back and try and reinterpret the past. So Benoit's arguments are that we kind of limit the scope of debate by how we frame nuclear problems and how we understand our past. And actually we need to go back and rethink, and this will open up new possibilities going forward. And I think that's probably exactly the sort of thing we need to do in this third nuclear age. Again, it doesn't have to just be about technology and politics. It could be about the way we think about threats, the way we think about nuclear weapons and the type of opportunities and possibilities there are going forward. And, and of course, I, I recognize there is a risk here um, that we expand the concept and maybe even expand the project too far and that it becomes a bit meaningless. But I do think it's a good vehicle to ask some of these questions which are pertinent um, and should be um, creating debate, even if people um, disagree. And I, I'm working on a paper there looking at the UK context here about how the recent UK, uh, the recent announcement by the UK to increase its uh, the, the limit on the stockpile of its warheads reflects a kind of very particular understanding of the UK's nuclear past and how the idea of minimum deterrence came about, which doesn't necessarily um, fit with the historical reality. So again, it's going back, reinterrogating what we think we know um, to maybe open up or at least refresh some of the debates today. So this is just a, uh, this slide is just to give a bit of an idea of some of maybe the takeaways of where we are now. And again, please feel free to push back on some of this stuff. Some is more obvious and, and less controversial than others, but I think nevertheless uh, important to, to, to state. So nuclear risks are, despite the fact that this project began um, acutely thinking about the impact of certain types of technology, it really is the impact of politics, geopolitics, norms and technology that, that we need to be looking at. And I think to try and look at technology individually um, is wrong. And I don't think we will get very many good answers um, going that way. Again, it links to this stuff that, that I said about the work with Benoit, but we should be very careful to assume that what we think worked in the past will work in the future. Um, critical engagement, not just because the context, the capabilities, the politics may have changed, but just because what we thought we worked in the past maybe didn't actually work um, in the way we think um, it might have done. A possibility to reimagine, and I use that word, reimagine arms control, governance and disarmament, because I think some of the ideas are already there, but have got a bit lost. We've become fixated on the idea of certain types of agreement or arms control having to be treaty based, having to be legal and formal. And actually, there's a lot of other stuff that can be done to help mitigate risk as well. Maybe less sexy, maybe less immediate, um, but nonetheless quite useful. Recognition, the diversification of actors involved in global nuclear order. On one level, we need to think globally, avoid that Euro-Atlantic um, uh, focus which seems to drive so much of this debate not least because a lot of the the work on this topic is a, is in English uh, and is done by excellent American or to a lesser extent European scholars but we also need to think about the influence of technology companies of other people within this space um, which increasingly may not be dominated just by governments uh, this is something that I'm thinking we're pretty clear from, from what I've said, but the, the nuclear non nuclear distinction is becoming increasingly blurred. It was probably never um, completely separate in the way that we like to think, but it is clear that certain types of capabilities now can perform the roles previously that only nuclear weapons could be used for. And that, I think, is a change. That is something that is um, changing the, 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 the strategic landscape. I think it's important to focus on pathways to nuclear use and risk reduction rather than weapons or domains. 
always get a bit worried in, in previous work when, when people were talking about cyber threats or it would have to be, you know, it's not something that's going to be contained to any one domain. These are things that work across domains. I mean, think about that. And in terms of escalation pathways, it goes back to that idea of it's not just about thinking about formal arms control agreements. It's about risk mitigation more broadly. None of these things are easy, but there's questions about how we build more time, dialogue and transparency into nuclear order more broadly, but adversary relationships in particular. I don't have any easy answers for how we do that, but I think they are all fundamental. The pressures at the moment seem to be for less time, less dialogue, uh, and increasingly difficult or less transparency, and none of those things, I believe, are good. This isn't new. This is as old as, as international relations scholarship, but perceptions matter here. I use the example of the possibility of US left of launch operations against North Korean missiles. It really doesn't matter whether the US has done that or not. The perception, the idea will be as influential um, anyway. There's also some broader things and, and perhaps there's no better audience or um, institution to, 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 to say this to, I mean, I'm preaching to the converted, but there's a real centrality of nuclear education, nuclear education and re-engaging communities in nuclear weapons issues. Um, getting that understanding, getting that engagement, making sure that nuclear risks are rightly at the top or at least part of people's understanding of the things um, that are important in society. I think this is absolutely essential, whether it be uh, at elite levels or whether it be even in primary uh, and very early years education. And then finally, and again, this is pretty obvious, but encouraging unconventional approaches to nuclear problems. Um, I think we really shouldn't be afraid to try and think outside of the box. If this is a third nuclear age, if the challenges are different, then maybe the way we go about doing this is different. It doesn't have to conform to a particular idea um, of what we did in the past. And then finally, just to, just to summarize before I give you guys a, a bit of a break, um, it, it seems to me, and this research is driven by a belief um, and a worry actually, that we're moving into a more dangerous and uncertain period in our nuclear history. Um, and that we may not have the current academic toolkit or level understanding or willingness in the policy world um, to really fully engage and minimize this. I've got no way of quantifying or proving this, but it strikes me that the, the risk of, of nuclear weapons being used in some way is probably rising rather than falling. And of course, let's not forget that we have at least a part survived the past because of a bit of luck. Yes, this is about technological change, and I think that is at its heart, but it is a co-constitutive and interlinked um, challenge. And the politics of this are absolutely fundamental and should not be forgotten alongside the sort of more technologically interesting and sometimes uh, novel aspects that, that we focus on. And again, never before, disruptive technologies are not new, the politics surrounding this is not new, but what is new is that there's so many non-nuclear technologies happening at, or being developed, being deployed at the same time, and that all have the potential, particularly together, to challenge some of these central beliefs and framework that we basically rely upon to understand our nuclear world. Of course, some of these dynamics might be fleeting or temporary, and we don't know, and that could well undermine the idea of a third nuclear age. We may be just in an uh, extended second nuclear age, or indeed we may not think that the idea of nuclear age is that useful um, at all. There is also, of course, from a previous slide, the risk that widening the concept uh, makes it increasingly meaningless. However, what I hope and what I hope that we're doing and, and we're starting to do and, and hopefully got across to you guys today is that this is about starting a debate. This is about raising awareness of a concern. This is about saying, look, here's some things that are going on that are dangerous. Engage with us. Tell us why we're wrong. Um, let's start. Let's think about this and let's work through it. Because I think only by doing that and by building people that are interested with different perspectives on this, um, can we manage the challenges in the years ahead? So with that, I'll have a quick rest and uh, over to you for questions. Thank you so much, Andrew. This was uh, a really fascinating. Uh, you know, I, I have the benefit of having heard it a version of this twice, and, and I, I certainly found your uh, your second uh, kind of reading uh, even more stimulating. So uh, thanks so much. Let me just, uh, Andrew, if I can start the question, and I see uh, we are getting uh, we have at least one person who's uh, uh, asked to uh, uh, to also uh, address uh, you. Um, one of the things that I thought was most interesting uh, at the uh, seminar that you gave at Harvard, and it was kind of at the tail end in the Q and A. Um, and I believe this was a, a, a question that was, was raised by, by Matt Bunn, although I don't want to uh, uh, distort uh, you know, his point, but I thought uh, he, he raised, uh, I think, the important issue about uh, you know, the uh, kind of the 
uh, degree of variance or the, the amount of, uh, of uh, change that one can attribute uh, in this new nuclear age uh, to technological developments uh, as opposed to geopolitical developments. And uh, there are a number of things that one could cite, uh, you know, whether it is the, uh, you know, the really dramatic rise of China, uh, as somebody who's focused on U.S.-Russian issues, for me, uh, it's this uh, nosedive in the U.S.-Russian relationship, uh, which for the first time really uh, since at least the, the mid uh, uh, or early 70s uh, or late 60s even extends to uh, nuclear nonproliferation. Uh, and so I think it would be interesting if you could kind of uh, see if you could provide us with a, your sense at this stage of your project about the, the relative importance you want to attribute to uh, uh, you know, technological change and other geopolitical developments, and also the, the degree to which you kind of see uh, these changes as kind of incremental in, in nature uh, or evolutionary, if you will, uh, as opposed to revolutionary. And uh, you know, you've talked you talked about kind of the bleeding from one uh, phase to an, another, but maybe you could say a little bit more about the the degree to which you see these changes as really uh, revolutionary. And then we'll turn to the uh, other folks who have questions. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think that's, as I kind of alluded to in the talk, the politics and geopolitics of this have become much more obvious as I've gone through. So a project that started looking at technology, it became very clear that this is not just about technology, not least because of how it's framed and everything else. And you're right. And, and I, in all honesty, I don't know which kind of came first, because I, I think some of these technologies have, to some extent, got their own path pathways or, or, or you know, almost path dependency. There is a certain amount of technological determinism that some of the things we're concerned about now can be traced back 40 years, 50 years in their inception and had very different ideas, some of which were just designed because or invest or um, developed because they could be. Um, you know, go right back to second offset, offset, or all that sort of stuff. The technologies, the um, so-called military revolution of the Gulf War. Many of these things can go back to that. A lot of U.S. stuff, but increasingly with others as well. But I don't know. I, but I think, I suppose you could look at it in two ways. So the, the technologies are not a concern in and of themselves. It is when they are embedded in political relationships and used by actors. And what makes this particular era really interesting, or one of the things that makes it really interesting is that you have these things happening at the same time of genuine global nuclear multipolarity. Um, and actors, yes, it's the rise of China. It's also the rise of India. It's a Russia that certainly never went away, but has reestablished itself um, after the 1990s. And it may well be from other corners as well. So I think you generally have a world where nuclear weapons are becoming more important. Power politics is returning, whether it went away, at least the attention of power politics is returning. And you have these technologies at the same time. And I honestly don't kind of know which, which came first, but they are intrinsically linked. And I think it is about, um, they've become new tools. And I, and, and I think it's the great power politics angle is what makes this particularly worrying, but I suppose also interesting. Without it, um, well, the 1990s and the 2000s are some of these technologies in their infancy with a basically US hegemon, roughly a unipolar system. We have something different now where actually the interaction engagement between these possibly in the future peer competitors um, creates a, a, a lot of challenges. So I think I don't have a brilliant answer for that yet, but I know it's important if, if, if that makes sense. Um, and it is something that, that, that really has to be um, engaged with. And this whole, whole idea of a revolution evolution i don't know um I, I i guess some bits will move faster at certain times than others um there, there isn't a eureka or i don't think there's a eureka moment when things change there's no obvious thing like the end of the cold war even though i think that was historically quite inaccurate for, for a number of reasons um what we might think of is a kind of a punctuated evolution where we keep moving to different stages of this and i suppose the other worry with or one of the arguments you could make about this whole idea of a third nuclear age is we might already be in it. We might already be quite a way along it. We just will only realise it in the future when we look back. And that's probably quite true also of, of, of the various other ages as well. Um, I don't think it's a revolution as such because some things haven't gone away. I, I think it's, it's a chance to go back and reassess what we think. It might be that a lot of things remain absolutely fundamental and haven't changed and 
Uh, I know a lot of pushback that I have with this talk is, well, look, you still can't destroy second strikes. Mad still works. Yeah, it, it, you know, oh, no, no one would be bonkers enough to do X, Y, and Z. But that kind of misses the point. It, it's about, well, what about all the other things and how we think about order, risks, and, and other stuff? So it's probably not a revolution, but I could see a punctuated evolution where we have certain periods of rapid technological change or deployment or breakthroughs, which could be quite significant. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. So I see uh, both Adrian English and Jeffrey Knopf. So Adrian, I think your hand went up first if you want to introduce yourself and ask the question. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for a very informative presentation. A lot of good information. I just had a question um, about your comment about less nuclear fear. That Andrew, if you, I, I, it's, I, Adrian, I'm not sure that we can hear you uh, yeah. clearly, so I can. If you could uh, try to speak up uh, as loudly as possible, that would be helpful. Maybe you can hear me a bit better now with the headphones. Yeah. Okay, um, thank you, Andrew, for a fantastic presentation. Your comment about less nuclear fear really got my attention. Do you see any silver lining benefits coming out of a third nuclear age? Could we see things like nuclear privatization and nuclear entrepreneurialism like we've seen in the space industry, in like SpaceX and Elon Musk? Do you see something like that happening in the third age with nuclear technology? And what is your opinion about potential third age technological developments that might drive positive things in the civilian space like nuclear propulsion or safer nuclear energy? Do you see those things coming into play? Yeah, some, some, some really good questions. And that kind of um, positive aspects is, all, is always something that, that I get asked about. And, and I think there has to be positive aspects, but it goes back to the politics question. It depends how these things are done. Um, decisions taken by officials, if they're regulated, and a whole host of other things as well. But the, in a sense, you could flip that question back on itself, that probably more so today than in the past, a lot of the developments here are coming from the private sector. You know, probably somebody at Google has got more idea about the, what some of the latest threats in this realm than somebody in DOD. I don't know. It, it's a fast-changing field. It is, um, as I sort of said, it's about different actors. So I think it's less about spin-offs in the civilian sector from what governments are doing and more governments trying to keep up with what's happening in the private or private's the wrong phrase, but the kind of scientific R&D environment and, and going that way, I think. So it's changing the stakeholders or the people that are important. This It's most it's clearly that it's most clear with AI automation, computer network operations, but I think could apply to other stuff um, potentially as well. Um, I haven't really thought about your your idea of nuclear privatization and entrepreneurialism. And if I'm brutally honest, I, I'm not entirely sure what, what that would look like. Um, I can't see governments being keen to, um, well, I, I definitely can't see governments giving over responsibility for nuclear use to companies. I, I don't see anything like that. I, I, I don't know if I've quite engaged with the question, but in this, the nuclear space has always been a bit different and rightly so. Um, and I think it will probably remain the preserve of governments and probably just a handful of people, the so-called nuclear monarchy, um, as uh, I think Daniel Dooney described it, or nuclear priesthood, sorry, um, going forward. And then your final question, less nuclear or, or about less nuclear fear, um, or, or that was your comment, sorry, but uh, on, on one hand, that's a good thing. On the other, I think it's a bit of a concern if people don't understand the world that we live in. And the analogy, so I'm not, not quite old enough to remember this, but the analogy that I always think, think of is how worried people were in this country in the early 1980s, right? The spate of films, TV stuff um, that came out, a real climate of fear around nuclear war. 1983, of course, being the sort of the culmination of it. Um, and we just don't have that anymore. And, and some, to some extent, that's a good thing. But likewise, and I remember when I came to the US 10 years ago and did some research for my book on missile defense, a lot of people said then the big difference today is from Star Wars era, um, much fewer people really understand these issues. And I'm not just picking on the US. I'm not just picking on the Senate. I think that's probably true across the board. So it's that kind of public engagement with nuclear risk and whether that's engagement that says well i'm more engaged now i think nuclear weapons are good or whether or whatever it is the importance is the engagement and the understanding 
Um, but it's also at that elite level where I think there is there are less and less people that really understand these issues and perhaps have the time or willingness to think them through. So, so that's where the fear stuff comes from. And I, I haven't done the research. I, I haven't got the the stats to back that up. It's a gut feeling that's something that I would like to sort of look into, really. But thank you for the question. Thanks, Andrew. I think just uh, as an aside, uh, uh, in reference to the idea of uh, nuclear entrepreneurial uh, activities and privatization, I think you're generally correct. I mean, I recall writing one of my first op-eds of the New York Times uh, in, I think, 1991, dealt with a, um, a group of, of Soviet, uh, recently Soviet, uh, now Russian, uh, nuclear entrepreneurs uh, from one of the, the uh, nuclear weapons laboratories that had formed a company called the Chetek Corporation. And uh, they were marketing internationally the use of nuclear explosions for environmentally uh, sound purposes, in particular, the disposal of chemical weapons, among other things. Uh, they, uh, and, and there was interest on the part of the Canadian government. They, I still have in my files someplace these glossy brochures. So uh, that was a, another age, uh, not the third nuclear age, perhaps, but it suggested that the notion of uh, uh, private uh, industrial uh, engagement in this sphere is not uh, without precedent. So I just cite that as a, as a historical note. Uh, let me turn to uh, Professor Jeffrey Knopf, yeah? Great, thank you, Bill. And um, great to see you, Andrew. Um, wish you could be in person, but uh, I, I agree with what you were saying at the beginning that um, it is nice that uh, technology allows us to host you uh, virtually. I, th I thought that was a great uh, talk. Um, I've been involved in sort of several things that have touched on bits and pieces of this, but, but you did a really nice job consolidating a whole bunch of different threads in a way that I think really um, draws attention to the important uh, implications. Um, I'm not sure I have a question per se, but I have sort of a few thoughts uh, I want to share. Um, one of which um, segues perfectly from, from the, the question you got from uh, Adrian and, and your response. Um, you know, I've, I've been thinking for a number of years now off and on about um, just kind of what the passage of time means and that, that um, you know, to me, I think part of what helped maintain, you know, nuclear peace and nuclear stability was that there was a, a healthy fear of nuclear war and you had national leaders in the key countries who had lived through nuclear crises uh, and understood that, you know, you have to be very careful not to sort of go too close to the brink, right? And, and today, outside of the India-Pakistan context, that, that's not true anymore. There's nobody in the U.S. or Russian government that has a firsthand memory of the Cuban Missile Crisis or the uh, Usuri River, you know, conflict or something like that. And so this um, lower kind of visceral appreciation of, of the dangers of nuclear weapons and nuclear crises, I think, is is one of the many threads <laughs> that, that makes it, it tougher to maintain nuclear stability. Uh, and I think what you have helped highlight for me in my mind is that the big difference from now in the 1960s is, you know, in the 1960s, we thought stability was a function of the nuclear balance, right? If one side has a secure second strike, the other side has a secure second strike, it's stable, right? And we don't have, we have to do anything else. And I, I, what I'm taking is the number one implication of your work is that that's just not true anymore, right? That, that stability could be undermined by this massive array of new and newish technologies that have come online. Um, so I, I wanna kind of just share, share two things with you. One is, is another talk that we had uh, recently that's really on point for one of the things you were talking about. Um, uh, our student uh, chapter of Women in International Security a few weeks ago had Jackie Schneider from you know, Hoover give a talk and she reported on these war games that she's been running with um, uh, Reed Polly and, and Eric Lynn Greenberg that are the intersection of cyber and nuclear, right? And across a bunch of different national contexts, so this is not just US, um, if they give one side in, in a in a crisis, a nuclear uh, impl implications crisis, uh, the idea that they have some kind of cyber exploit where they could successfully launch a cyber attack on the other side preemptively, they almost always do it, which just 
set my hair completely standing on end. It, it completely horrified me, but it's a perfect illustration of what you're talking about, that stability could be undermined because somebody thinks they have a cyber advantage and they try to preempt, you know, don't think of it as something that could, could trigger a nuclear war. So there's a lot of synergies there. Um, so the, my, my final sort of comment is, is one where maybe I, I can make it a question, which is, I don't know that there is a sort of mutual restraint or arms control solution here. Like I think, you know, the genie's out of the bottle as they say, right, these technologies are coming online. So it, it may be back to recreating that sort of healthy fear of nuclear war, making sure that the top leaders in all the relevant countries just have this visceral awareness that you know, like, hey, just because I have a cyber exploit doesn't mean I should do it. Like, this is dangerous stuff and, and recreate the, the sense of caution and self-restraint in the minds of elites. Uh, so I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts about things that would, would contribute to making that, uh, you know, that sort of, um, uh, what I guess I've started to call in, in a, a, a sort of paper I have in circulation of the cognitive uh, base or cognitive foundation of stability. Can we, how can we strengthen that cognitive foundation? Thank you. Thanks very much, Jeff, and uh, nice to see you too. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, we'll I'll see you again in person soon. Um, thanks for the comments. I think I think re really, really useful ones. That the, the point you made about the war game and Jack and stuff, and that people use the cyber exploit, I, I think is really worrying because that if the other players know that that might be a possibility as well, that causes all sorts of problems. And there's all this stuff about well, if you've actually got it. How confident are you? Is it misplaced confidence if you've got it? Which, and I think it's it's a bit of a minefield. Actually, it begins to get um, increasingly problematic. Um, but I think it does go to your bigger problem that there's just a well, almost like an apathy, I suppose, amongst various different parts of uh, of global populations. I think um, perhaps perhaps less so in south asia but, but but i don't know it's something that i want to talk to people there and find out a bit more about but um i, I guess this the answer to it is thinking about who you're trying to impact or on what you're trying to get them to think I, I i i don't know how you make policymakers more worried about this other than explain things very simply and say this is where it could go really bad um the methods that I think seem to work quite well in the past for more broadly, and indeed, you know, possibly even for Ronald Reagan and various other people, is the use of films. Or, or, or perhaps, you know, we come forward a few years, but various forms of media. Because um, I do think that had a real impact. If you watch, what are some of the great, so that, was it the day after, um, War Games is there, and that's a bit different, of course, but also... Um, the uh, the UK one that the name escapes me, and um, it was really really graphic. Um, that's a way of scaring people. That's a way of saying, look, this is awful. Yeah, I think I think that film was Threads. Threads, that's it. Yeah, where, where Sheffield got, or just outside Sheffield, and, and there's a population of Sheffield, isn't it? That get born. I'd recommend that to anyone that wants that, that doesn't want to sleep for a week. That's um, but it's um, I I think that's a way of doing. It. I, I've also toyed with an idea. It's not really related to this project, but of how you get this sort of stuff. And it'd be interesting to know if you guys are engaged in this into fairly sort of primary early years education. Um, it might might seem a bit bonkers. I mean, my my partner's a, a deputy head at, at a primary school over here, and um, I don't think she wants me going and scaring all the kids. I think they have enough things going on to worry about. But but there is something to it about how do we inculcate this idea that this is something important so so i would suspect you will learn about climate change now at primary school you will probably now increase where well, you'll be very familiar with the idea of pandemics um, and then maybe we need to push this to say that this is something that people need to be aware of at least some basics and i think i think there's a, there was a ladybird nuclear weapons i don't know if it was laurie freeman that did it or someone did it but a ladybird nuclear weapons but with stuff like that i think is quite important how we reach so i think actually that's more clear cut how we do it whether it's more likely but in terms of Policymakers, I think it's finding people that are willing to listen and getting them in a room and being as simple as putting it as simple as possible. Um, having people that are, you know, that are good, and also having people that go into government that are that are interested in this stuff. Um, it's probably difficult, isn't it, if you're a policymaker and you've got a hundred different things you need to be an expert on, but it's trying to make sure we raise it up up the agenda. I mean, Jeff, you or, or, or Bill, you you may well have better ideas for that, but I think it's a it's something that has to happen. I'm, I'm less clear on how, how we do it sometimes. Andrew, let me, let me add, I don't know, I know Elaine White, uh, Ambassador White has, has been on the call and has to leave soon, but 
since she's the one person uh, in this group uh, who could kind of uh, talk to the issue of, you know, the diplomatic community and their receptivity to kind of these kinds of thoughts. I, I mean, if you're still on the line, uh, I want to give you a chance if you wanted to react at all to what uh, Andrew's been discussing. Although I do know from the, the chat thing that you were about mm -hmm. to leave. So uh, if you are able to unmute, that would be great. Uh, but if not, I will understand it and uh, we'll have to pass here. I don't know if Elaine is still uh, with us here. So Andrew, but the, the person who, I mean, I can answer uh, the one question that you asked about, uh, you know, uh, engaging younger people, but I, I do believe that Masako Toki is, 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 is with us. So I wanna see if she would like to, uh, to respond uh, on the educational issue and uh, engaging younger people. Masako, do you want to say uh, that? Yes, uh, I, I was just so excited. <laughs> Hi, Andrea, it's good to see you. I really, really enjoyed. And uh, where I was looking at your 10 points, like uh, moving forward, I really believe that uh, the combi you know, we have to implement all of these. Each one, each point is really great. But uh, as a strong believer of the power of education, and uh, I, as Dr. Pora mentioned, um, I'm very passionately working for the youth education, especially high school students. Uh, currently, I'm engaging Japanese, Russian, and American students. But uh, I really think, but, uh, in the process of uh, conducting this process, I kept thinking how we could engage more young generations. Young generation really don't have a, a sufficient opportunity to be exposed to this topic. But once they learn their interest and um, really enhance, and uh, some of them are really committed to work for a uh, nuclear field. And I also invited uh, uh, undergraduate students <laughs> to this meeting, uh, incoming undergraduate uh, fellows. So I strongly believe the uh, importance of uh, uh, education. But uh, actually, I also wanted to mention uh, obviously, I'm originally from Japan, and I'm also following some Japanese publication. And interestingly, the very recently, I'm sure that you are familiar with the Nagasaki University, the new research center. Um, they just published exactly the same title as your topic, the mm -hmm. third nuclear age, I think. And uh, I haven't read it yet because it just came. But um, one thing I already thinking is, uh, you know, perhaps this thinking maybe very Japanese or maybe to, I don't know how to say, but uh, how we can get rid of the concept of a nuclear deterrence, you know, that's really central to many nuclear disarmament advocate argument. And especially in Japan, that country who are uh, depending on uh, extended nuclear deterrence. But uh, I also understand that this uh, argument itself are really not so effective. So when I was looking through your list, uh, I just thought it's really uh, efficient to, to have a multifaceted approach, and of course, but uh, I, I wanted to ask you, based on the, the, your list, you also mentioned uh, like uh, using the unconventional approach, and I'm sure that there are many uh, unconventional approaches, but uh, if you have any like uh, some ideas in terms of unconventional approaches, and also if you could mention how if we are going to get rid of nuclear deterrence, what kind of a security system could you replace nuclear deterrence? Yeah. yeah. So thank you. I'm not sure if I made sense, but uh, thank you. I really enjoyed your talk. Well, thank, thank you very thank you very much for your comments, and that's uh, I'll definitely look for that. Um, uh, that the paper that you mentioned, the Nagasaki paper, that would be um, be really really interesting to have a look at that. Um, in terms of how we get rid of deterrence, part of the well, and I don't know if this is the way, and it kind of fits in with the thinking outside the box stuff. But there's a there's a there's a growing field of critical nuclear scholarship, for want of a better word, within international relations. It's, it's probably a bit more European than it is American, I think. So. You may have come. Some of you may have come across um, Nick Ritchie, for example, who's, who's over at the University of York, who writes a lot about devaluing 
um, as a concept, a delegitimizing this sort of thing. So it feeds in, a, and he worked quite closely with the humanitarian impacts people, which is a similar sort of language around that. And uh, maybe, and I don't know if that's the solution, but that is an avenue. And that is about trying to change the debate, I suppose, trying to, I mean, he's not going to convince, I mean, it, it gets pretty short, Nick gets pretty short shift in the UK government that says, well, that's great, but we want to keep them for these reasons, whatever. But, but, but that is the way to go. And that links in, you know, it, it's thinking differently about this. It may not always work, but it is thinking critically, thinking outside the box. And it fits in with this unconventional approach. And I don't necessarily have any off the shelf things that you could do, but one thing and you, that could possibly happen um, at your institution and especially with the connections is just get a load of people in a room and say, right, come up with an outlandish idea um, and just brainstorm and say, look, it really doesn't matter. Say, say something. Silly. And I sometimes do a similar thing with my um, undergraduate students. So some of them are not that well versed in nuclear issues. Often it's the first time they've come to it doing my course and halfway through, we just have a session and say, right, well, what, what would you do? So what's your solution? And sometimes because they haven't been spent all the time thinking along certain in certain ways, come up with very different ideas of different ways of thinking about problems. So it's, so I don't have any off the shelf ideas. I just I, I just think it's so important that we encourage people with things that might seem wacky. I don't know that, that you have. I know Heather Heather Williams has written about asymmetric stuff. That's an obvious place to go, isn't it? But lots of things like that about how do we getting away from ideas of numbers and quantifying things and legal agreements and even um, declarations not to do something is a form of arms control, right? I mean, it's not as, it's not as brilliant as if you can get a legally binding treaty, but it, but it helps. Even, you know, certain actions, certain things you do. So it's, it, it's trying to broaden it out and, and not having to, not letting the perfect arms control agreement get in the way of some of these other things which can help um, stabilise more broadly but but i think it is about finding a space and also getting different voices in it's it, I, i'm sure you found this and, and others on the call have found it as well but um because of the crossover with some of my work between cyber and nuclear i've been lucky to meet a lot of sort of um, information technology professionals or computing professionals and they have very very different ideas about these types of problems than i do because they come at it from a completely different perspective um quite often they tell me why well that can't happen because of x y and z or, or, or i should be more about this so it's about getting different people in the room with different perspectives and making sure this is no longer and i think jeff put it really really well i'm probably going to ruin the ruin the context but nuclear weapons are no longer the key thing about the, 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 the central strategic balance it's about these other technologies and therefore you need people that understand other fields in that room as well to figure out how to mitigate the challenges it poses uh, that they pose but um, as I say I, I don't have any immediate ideas other than the fact that this is something that needs to be facilitated um, and the other thing as well is and this is a, it's a bit a bit cliche but getting young people in a room diverse young people in a room to that haven't lived through you know, or, or don't feel like they have to think in certain ways is, is useful which is why I think you know speaking to people when they're young is, is good but no, I'll, I'll finish rambling sorry that's Thank you so much. Yeah, when uh, uh, former uh, you under Secretary of General, sorry, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Ban Ki Moon, came to the CNS uh, 2013, he really encouraged young people to come up with a good idea that could replace nuclear deterrence. <laughs> so I just kept thinking about it. But thank you so much. I really appreciate you. Andrew, we're, I think we're, you know, we are kind of approaching the, um, the 90 minute mark here. The one thing that, you know, comes to mind um, in our discussion here and uh, the fact that Elaine quite left before we had a chance to kind of call upon her. Uh, one thing that we could actually do, I think quite readily, uh, predict, particularly in this environment where people are uh, uh, more likely to attend a virtual call than to perhaps travel uh, for a meeting, uh, and we can talk about this offline, but uh, I think we could probably assemble a fairly significant group of uh, diplomats uh, to kind of hear your presentation. Uh, you might kind of gear this particularly to a, uh, you know, a, 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 an audience of practitioners as, as opposed to, to uh, uh, scholars and, 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 and students and uh, try to provide you with some feedback. I mean, I think it would be useful kind of, you know, uh, kind of a, a mid-course kind of correction. Um, and there's certainly, you know, individuals, I mean, Alexander Comant has just come out with a, a new book uh, dealing with the negotiation of the TPNW. But uh, I think if in fact the review conference is postponed as I, as I believe will be the case, 
maybe doing something either uh, you know the summer or in the fall, uh, we could organize this. Uh, if it made sense from a time standpoint, I could also ask <clears throat> one of our colleagues at the Vienna Center to organize this. And I think it would be a, you know, a really interesting uh, forum. So uh, uh, let me suggest that to you. If you're interested, we can maybe collaborate in, in organizing that kind of a gathering for you. That, that, that would be absolutely amazing. Something like that would be brilliant. I mean, the, the, it's, well, as, as you know, working in this field, it's th that's who you want to get through to, right? And, and if, I, if I'm barking up the wrong tree, if these things have already been thought about, brilliant, I'm pleased. <laughs> um, but if it, it's about getting feedback from the people, what's useful for them? What, what do they need to understand this or make the case or or whatever else? That, that would be incredibly useful. And it's, I think it's one of the things in this project that I want to do is keep going back to people and saying, look, here's some ideas. Are, are we going in the right direction? What do you think? What are we missing? Um, or, and also that thing about, I think it's more, more of a problem in the UK than it is in the US, but making sure that some of the products of this research are usable by people, that it isn't just a book that, you know, most people won't read and policymakers definitely won't. So I think that's really important to, to, to understand the needs of those people to, to put this stuff in action as well. We will, we will plan to do that. Uh, let me uh, express uh, appreciation on behalf of, of CNS uh, and the friends of CNS for uh, a superb presentation, a very stimulating one. And uh, I really hope that in the not too distant future, we can ask you to uh, give a seminar in person in Monterey. So, we look forward to that. Uh, please join me in thanking our speaker.